It was 2009, and I was looking for a job. I know many of you may be there right now with this economy and all the craziness going on in the world. But for me, it was right after 2007, 2008. You guys can all remember that. I was in college, and I was turning 21 in 2009, and I was like, I was ready for the workforce. I was ready to make some money. And I was like, young guy, and I knew that I wanted to do this crazy thing that I was not qualified for at all called personal training. Now, if you want to be a personal trainer, you have to go through certifications. You have to get qualified. And there are certain steps, especially back then, it was a lot harder. And you, if you didn't have these qualifications, you couldn't get the job. And at the time, Bally Total Fitness was the giant of the day. They had the most locations. They were the place to be. Man, if I'm going to be a personal trainer, I'm going to be a personal trainer there. And all these guys that were personal trainers, they had a big red shirt. And on the back, it was in big black personal trainer. And I said, that's going to be me. And I remember getting a resume together. And I had no work experience. I had none of that. And I would bring it there. And they would throw it in the garbage. For weeks, I would go there day after day after day, and I would bring this resume in, and they would throw it in the garbage. I think it was around the third or fourth week, they finally realized, this guy is really persistent. If we don't tell him physically, no, he's going to keep coming here, bringing in a resume, doing this over and over and over again. So finally, they tell me, hey, look, we're not promising you a job. We're not promising you the work. But if you want to show up, we're taking about a good group of these guys. I think it was like 14 to 20 young men. And they were there. And a lot of them were qualified, had certifications that I didn't yet have. And he says, if you can beat out these guys, we're only taking four positions. If you're good enough to be here, you'll beat these guys. Deal? And I said, you know what? I'll be there. When does that start? Tomorrow. So immediately I go out and I buy the dummies guide to personal training. I don't know. Some of you young people, you guys have artificial intelligence. You have Google and Siri. You have all of these websites at your fingertips. During my time, you went to these books called The Dummies Guide. All right? If you were ignorant and you couldn't get to some of these things, I went to The Dummies Guide, and they said, okay, this is how you be a personal trainer. You bring a towel, show up on time, you do these things. And so I'm looking through all the business aspects of it all, and all I know are fundamentals on weight training and fitness. And I go in there, and the very first thing the top trainer does, his name is Tony, he takes us all into it, and he says, you guys are all going to do a full body workout. And I'm going to have you all break down into pairs of two, and you're going to have that person work out, and then you're going to give them your workout. And his entire time, he's assessing us as a group. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about fitness, when you're doing a whole body workout like that, you want to start with the bigger muscle groups and then you want to work to the smaller muscle groups. Your biggest muscle group on your entire body is your legs. So I was like, first thing in my brain, first two exercises, I already know what to do, the legs. Second largest muscle group, it's your back. So we're going to get to your back. And then after the back, we're going to move to the front and then we're going to move to the auxiliary things like your triceps, your arms, your shoulders. And we're going to work through and end with our calves, and it's going to be a good day. And so I just kind of had this whole system in my brain, but I didn't know at the time it was going to work. Remember, none of us knew what the top trainer was going to do before going in there. And so all we had was to perform at that moment. So we all perform on the knowledge of what we have. At this point, even the ones who had certifications, just because they had certifications, it didn't mean they understood the principles of physical fitness. And it doesn't mean they could train other people. Because remember, this wasn't just any gym. This was Bally Total Fitness, all right? It was the brand. It was the biggest in the business. And I wanted to be in that world. So I make the cut. I'm the fourth guy out of all three of them. You know, there's one, two, three, and then you have one slot left out of that group of 14 to 20, and I make it. I am ecstatic. I am 21 years old. The very first week they give me the shirt, and then came all the responsibilities, meeting the quotas. I actually had to be productive, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe they expected that out of me? I had to make phone calls, cold calls. I had to do things that I wasn't used to doing. 
and nobody was going to get me used to it. I had to do the work. And I'm doing all these things, and I got really good at it. Within the three months that I was doing it, I was telling my dad in the fourth month, I said, Dad, I don't need to go to Liberty University anymore. I am, I am good. I did the math. I did the numbers. If I follow on the same trajectory, Dad, I am making 70 to 80K a year. I'm doing great. Why do I need education? And my dad was talking to me about the unforeseeable future. He's talking to me about my calling that he knew I already had. My dad never made it about making money. It was always about living in the purpose that God had for me. And he knew that that was a heavy calling on me. And I remember at that point, I'm just enamored by the money. I'm enamored by the system, the process. I finally found something I'm good at, but was it really my calling? Did I feel a calling to personal training? The answer was no. I knew I had a calling to preach the gospel, but I couldn't see a path for that to work out for me in the long run. Now, my dad at the time was going through a massive heart problem. Many of you know he had his heart taken out of his chest for 30 minutes. They put his body on ice. And when you have a dad that possibly could be dying, he does this crazy thing called the last dying wishes of a father. Now, when your dad's going through a process, by the way, you know, disclaimer, he didn't die, all right? He is still alive. But at the time, I didn't know that. And as I'm going through that, in my mind, you know, this person that has been placed in my life, my father is giving me his dying wishes and he wants me to be at liberty. He wants me to get a degree. And now it comes between, am I going to be obedient to my father or am I going to do what I want to do? You see the challenge there? Now, dad raised me the right way. And so I just, you know what? He knows a thing or two that I might not. So I, I give away, you know, training. And I said, well, if I can pick up some training at Liberty, I'll pick some odd end jobs. And I do that. And years go by and now it's to the end of my process at Liberty. And you know what happens? Valley Total Fitness files chapter 11 bankruptcy. What's so crazy is I couldn't see that happening. I couldn't see a world where all those little things were going on behind the scenes. And the guy that I worked with, his name was Andy, and Tony was the head of personal training. And then Andy, who was over all the departments, Andy, who owned all these ones, he owned the one over here, he owned the one in Miller Square, he owned the one at South Miami, all these different locations, US one, they're his. And all of those places he makes absolutely zero on. The only top people at the executive branch, they do a short sale on the entire company, and the people that were underneath, the franchise owners of those buildings, they made goose egg, not a zilch, nothing. A couple months later, I see him working at the front desk of an LA Fitness, and I go, what happened? And he says, I figured he made out like a bandit with four buildings, four locations, nothing. Don't put your treasures on this earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves can break in and steal. Put your treasure in Christ. Put your hope in Jesus. What I love about what I'm learning in Hebrews, for those of you who don't know, we're going through a series called Greater and we're learning about the book of Hebrews and how in every way Christ is greater. And what I'm helping you understand today is that we've learned about how he's greater as a teacher, as an apostle, as a prophet. But what I need you to see is that in a way that I was underqualified and I worked to a place of being qualified, I was still not a perfect personal trainer. I had my flaws. I wasn't the greatest. When we look at the qualifications, today's message is titled this, More Than Qualified. I need you to understand that in every way, Jesus, when you're sizing up, should I believe, should I not? Should I live out my faith? Should I just do what I want to do? Jesus in every way is not only deserving of your trust, he is the only one that you should be placing your faith in because he's the only one who can give a return. See, a lot of you guys are not in control of the future, but God is. And so man can plan his ways, but the Bible says the Lord directs his steps. We can think we have such a firm grip on this world, a firm grip on the things in our life, but you know what? God is the one who not only has a grip on the world, but he's got a grip on your hearts. He's got a grip on your minds. 
And when his word goes into your hearts and in your minds, it doesn't return void. It's almost as if everything in the Old Testament, all the liturgical systems, all the order that was brought in through the Levitical order, because remember guys, these people, a million plus had left Egypt They had gone into the desert. They had rejected the promised land. And when they started to wander, their hearts were going astray. They rebelled. We saw that with Korah. They tried to say, you know what? We're going to appoint our own leader. We're going to do what we want to do. And every single time they did that, it did not pan out well for them as a people group. They were supposed to be devoted to serving God. They tried doing things their own way. And so God, he sets up a system through the Levitical order that while that in and of itself was amazing, beyond even the Levitical scope, there was a special family, the Aaronic family. And within that family, that family alone was to actually be the high priest. And these high priestly positions, guys, were not many like today where you have pastors and preachers and priests, and you have denominations and you have all these different breakdowns, there was one high priest for all of Israel. Just one. So let's not get it confused. We cannot compare the pastors of the day, the priests of the day to the high priestly position. It doesn't even compare. So while the high priest is there, once a year, this high priest would have to represent the people, that's you, ladies and gentlemen, and have to bring the blood of a perfect lamb and bring it before the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and pour it there so that you, ladies and gentlemen, could be forgiven. Now, before he ever did any of that, he had to make sure his own life, he was doing the right thing. He had to make sure in his own life, he had actually gone to God because We're going to see today in the lesson that not only was there a system in place, but that system was just a foreshadowing, a foreshadowing of what Jesus would ultimately do in and through himself. And where the high priestly order was lacking, in every way, Jesus is sufficient. In every way, Jesus is supreme. In every way, Jesus goes above and beyond our expectations, above and beyond our failures, and he perfectly represents the office of high priest above and beyond our expectations. So we have to understand, Jesus is not just qualified, but top your neighbor today, he's more than qualified. So let's get into the word today. Here in Hebrews chapter five, verse one, he says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed in matters pertaining to God for the people to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, many of you enjoy this idea that you don't need to kill a lamb every time you sin. And if you were poor, give a grain offering because you couldn't afford a lamb. Many of you don't understand the selection process. Imagine guys, you've made a mistake and you have to get a perfect lamb and you're a farmer. You can't just give any little lamb. Some of you guys have raised dogs. Raise your hand if you love dogs. Oh man, we know who all our cat lovers are now, all right? You're like, oh, I don't know if I like them the same way now. They didn't raise their hands about dogs. It's okay, no one's judging. This is church. We're gonna love each other, all right? I'm mad at the differences. But if you raise some dogs, you'll realize that you have a batch and a litter and there's one dog that always comes out a little bit smaller. Maybe has a deformed arm or a deformed tail and you've built a relationship with all these dogs, but that little runt, you're like, eh, I don't know if anybody's gonna buy them. I don't know if anybody wants that deformed, malnourished, little measly dog, the runt of the litter. We'll see what happens. And what's so interesting is, is that Most people, they will do what's convenient and they will do what's easy in the area of sacrificing. And so when we think about God selecting a perfect lamb, he would find a lamb without blemish, a perfect lamb. And that means it's worth something to you. Not only is it worth something to you, it is valuable. So 
It's beyond this idea of giving God that which is less than, but imagine giving God your greatest gift that you could think imaginable. It not only costs you something, you care innately about this lamb. It is part of your family. Now you're getting to a deeper emotion that God is planting there for you guys to receive, for you to see, so that when we get into the word here, as Jesus He's not just any high priest that has gone before. He is the God man. He is the incarnate Christ. He has stepped into creation. He is the Logos completely and fully. And where man was deficient, Jesus is sufficient and not only sufficient, but supreme. He's supreme as high priest. And we're gonna see how in just a second. In verse two, he says, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he is also clothed with weakness. Now, I want to get into some scripture today, but before we get into this, I need you to appreciate this high priestly position. I got a picture that I want you guys to see. And in this picture in the back, I know it's not the greatest, but you can catch a little bit more. We did a Wednesday night breaking down the temple, breaking down all these things. I would encourage you guys on Wednesday nights, come to the Bible studies. We do not have one this Wednesday as we will be at the convention, but next Wednesday we'll be starting up. But we went through this on Wednesday night and we talked a little bit more about this. And you see there, this high priest, he's dressed pretty nice. Would you guys agree? He's got some swag, you could say, all right? He is beautifully dressed and God has beautifully clothed him for a specific purpose. And even more than that, there are these systems that we see but we can't understand them until we actually see what they really mean in the long haul. So here we see the very first aspect in that veil, the first veil. And you step into the first area, this is where the priest in the Levitical order would come. They would do sacrifices, they would do things for the people. And then when you went into the second aspect, this is where the high priest would actually get right with the Lord. And now here's the very last aspect where they would only go during when? once a year to make atonement for the people of Israel. Now this final aspect, the holies of holies, this place is sacred beyond meaning. A sacredness that is more for you than it is for God. Think about this. It's more for you than it is for God. Because if that veil is not there and you as a sinner get judged by God's presence, you will surely die. So we have to see that what sin has done since the creation order has been disoriented by sin when Adam and Eve committed it in the garden long ago has had ripple effects on humanity ever since. And this great chasm called sin has created a great divide between you and the Father. Not that God does not want to be close with his creation, but because of sin and his holiness, he needs atonement for it. Or if you were to stand in the presence of God without the atonement for your sin, God would have to reckon you and deal with you immediately. So this is a good thing, ladies and gentlemen, to have the veil. The veil protects you from God's wrath in areas of your sin. So if you ever wonder, like, I've sinned and a lightning bolt didn't strike me dead. I've done something wrong and I didn't get caught. Just know this, is that God, he still sees it. God, he still knows. And there is a day of reckoning. There is a day, according to scripture, where you have to give an account. There is judgment that you invite into your life. But God is long suffering and God is gracious and merciful and just because you don't get dealt with in that very moment doesn't mean that God is not dealing with your sin. Could it be that God's grace is also at work? Could it be that God's grace is also ministering to you? Could it be that God's grace is, is actually going further than sin ever could and showing you the love of God, not that he is okay with your sinning, but that this great divide that is there was there initially for the protection of humanity so that they could actually learn to come before a holy God on his own standards. And his standards is perfection. His standard is holiness. Remember what the cherubims would say, the angels would say, holy, holy, 
holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's holiness. And this is the big problem with us because of sin, we're not holy. The Bible says it this way, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. And so God has to make a means for it. And so here the high priest would go into this process. Can we go back to the high priest? He would go into the veil and he would do this on behalf of the people and he would go through each system. And what's so beautiful, there's even a part in the system where they wash the hands and that washing of the hands, it seems like it's about purification, but all it's really foreshadowing is the baptism in the spirit that you are later gonna have through Jesus Christ. And so what they could not appreciate partially in Christ Jesus, we can appreciate fully. Are you following? So all of these systems are set up for your benefit so that you can get to God and that that atonement, that blood sacrifice that is needed once a year at Yom Kippur can be placed on the mercy seat, poured out, for you intentionally so that you can be made right, that you can be justified before God and that you can have access to him. Now, if you notice the clothing there, his garment that is very blue, guys, it was intricate and it wasn't just like what we see today. It had immense dignity and spiritual significance. Guys, this robe of blue attached to the robe's hem was pomegranate artistically woven from blue, purple, and scarlet yarn placed intermittently between small golden bells that rang musically with his every movement. Now, it wasn't just about keeping him alive. It was about this act of worship that was going on, that the priest was doing one thing for you. He was representing you, the people. Now, I'm gonna help you guys understand some theological truths here. I want you to all say prophet. I want you to say priest. Not the same thing. A prophet, he is representing God to the people. The priest represents the people to God. Is that helpful? Making it a little bit easier for you to understand? So you can understand and appreciate these offices as God gave them and designated them for his people. And he does so, so that we appreciate it. And I want you to see guys, he's clothing them with these bells so that this active worship was going in, he is literally going before the Lord, not on just his own behalf, but on the behalf of all of you. Because remember, they don't have Jesus yet. They don't have Jesus the way that we do. They have the law. And in the law, they realize they fall short. In the law, they realize if you fall in one area of the law, you are guilty of all of it. You are a law breaker. So all the law does is show you that you're not perfect. And it shows you how perfect and holy your actual God is. It puts things into perspective, doesn't it? This is done so that none of us develop pride like Satan. None of us develop an ego thinking that we can do this on our own, but that we learn to lean into God for our strength, even in areas of our weaknesses. We see here this movement that would go on. There was an apron-like ephod that would go over him. That's the blue thing we see in the picture. Woven of gold threads, finely twisted linen, blue, purple, scarlet yarn was worn over the robe, a priestly apron. So I want you to imagine he's going around and he's doing this, but the shoulder pieces of the ephod each bore a large onyx stone. Now I want you to think these large onyx stones that's on the priest that represents all of you, because you can't do what he's doing. God designates this high priest to do this for you. So it's good that he's living right before the Lord. It's a, it's a very important thing. So he puts these things, these things on his shoulder, these onyx stones, and on the onyx stones, there are six names written here and six names written here. Do you know what they are? The tribes of Israel. And they're done in birth order. So not only are there six stones on the shoulder, what is the point of that? The point of it is that God, he carries the concerns, the problems, the issues, the sin on his shoulders. He's carrying it. 
He's carrying the concerns to God. Remember from the people, he's bringing it to God. And he cares about all these 12 tribes. He cares about Israel. And not just that, let's go a little bit deeper, fast into the front of the ephod, this great breastplate that's held together by chains. This is this nine inch square tapestry of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and linen. And it bore four rows of three stones. So four rows, three stones, all right? First, ruby, topaz, and beryl. The second is turquoise, sapphire, and emerald. The third is jasonith, agate, and amethyst. And the fourth is chrysolite, onyx, and jasper. A lot of stones here. But if you add them up and you're really good at math, it equals 12 again. And the 12 great stones, each engraved with the name of what and who? The name of Israel and all the 12 tribes again. So it's not just that Israel's concerns are on his shoulder. As a high priest, he bears it on his heart. This is what's so beautiful about all the things that they would do in the liturgical practices. It wasn't about you guys falling in love with the liturgical things. Because there are people that are after tradition today and they're missing the point of it all. They're saying, I want more tradition and I want more systems. Why is the pastor not coming up with incense? Why are we not doing all of these things that we saw done before? Guys, because there are certain systems that have become outdated because of the other process, which is Jesus coming in and being superior to those old things. God is not trying to get you back to that time of the Old Testament. He's trying to get you forward to the time where he comes back. Now, it doesn't mean that we negate the things of the past and say the past does not matter and the Jewish faith does not matter. We need to appreciate those things, but what they understood partially, we see is revealed wholly. How so? Well, this person, guys, as he took these on, all 12 stones on the shoulders, and we see the two stones on the shoulders and the 12 stones on his chest, he would take these things, this heart, along with the mysterious Urim and Thunim, and he would place them all together. And lastly, the priest was crowned with a turban of fine linen, bearing a plate of gold with the Hebrew inscription. Guess what it said on him? Holy to the Lord. Guys, what a sight to see this during that period of time. But let me tell you, what a sight to see Jesus lifted up in your life and realize that he is your high priest. And he is clothed in majesty. He is clothed in glory that you sometimes know nothing about because you're still attracted to the former things. Instead of looking to Christ and realizing in Christ, he has done all things. How do I know so? Well, we see in verse two, he says, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant. Mm. I know that's not said of anyone here today. None of you have been found ignorant. You know your Bible. You spend time in God's word. But I know some people that are Pharisees in their minds and they are far from God in their hearts. And if God were to look into them, they can quote to you Bible verses, but they can't show you in their heart and in their life, a life full of faith. Because it's not just one thing to hear the word. Remember Shema, listen and obey. Listen and do what God has called you to do. We have to remember guys, as believers in Christ, it's not just about understanding the word, it's about living out the word. And if we're truly living out the word, we have not just bought into this notion that these things were true in the past, but if they were true in the past for the people of Israel, and then Jesus Christ comes in, when Jesus Christ comes in, what was so important about his coming? Because no longer were they gonna have to come through this ritualistic slaughtering of lambs, this ritualistic coming forth with these grain offerings and everything else, no, in every way, Jesus Christ is the ultimate offering. In every way, Jesus Christ is the ultimate priest. In every way, he is eternal and his blood is everlasting. And those who call in the name of Jesus, his blood is there for your sins. His blood is there for the next generation's sins. His blood is still flowing off from that cross all the way going back to Calvary. It is still in effect. It has not gone off. It is still working and active and moving in people's lives today. We have to remind people that the gospel, guys, is effective. If the angels 
and the law was abiding to them and something that was actually held to account. And they said, you are going to be held accountable for this law. How much so with Christ coming down and bringing to you the gospel? That's the great comparison. It's made in chapter one and chapter two of Hebrews. So understanding and leaning on that truth, now we need to see that Jesus is our high priest. Well, what does that really mean? Well, it says he's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he also clothed with weakness. There's one part in scripture that speaks of his weakness more than any part. And it's actually the part where he goes through right before the crucifixion in Gethsemane. I need you guys to open up to Matthew 26. And here we see how he's not just having the Levites and the priestly order do things liturgically for the sake of the things that they were doing. It's not just about getting right on a momentary basis once a year at Yom Kippur. It's not just about the feast and all these things. There is a deeper implication that we can miss if we fall in love with the traditions more than the one who made the order in the first place, which is Jesus. So here we see it fulfilled in Gethsemane, and we see this high priest position coming to fruition. Let's see here in verse 36. It says, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, when you see there in the text, it says sorrowful and troubled, does that sound like someone that is a God or does that sound like someone that is human? I don't know about you, he's related to me. I go through tough times and it's very easy to victimize. It's very easy to say, man, this is the worst. It's very easy to feel in the moment the weight of your problems. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So we can get that. But Jesus, he feels even more because he's not just any man. The Bible says he is the God man, 100% God, 100% man. And in this way, in his humanity, he can speak to you with gentleness. Well, how so? Well, he knows a thing or two about suffering. He knows a thing or two about tempting and being tempted and going through all that stuff. He is tempted himself, not just by anybody. The Bible says he was tempted by Satan. Now, many of you have been tempted maybe by a demon or maybe just by your television and Netflix, all right? But you've never been tempted by by demons and let alone maybe be tempted by the devil himself. But guys, Jesus went through the devil's tempting, went through all that. Jesus, he went through the tempting of position, getting to be king and getting what he wanted when he wanted it. In every way, guys, there were so many temptations around Jesus that it's almost no matter where he turned, he could fall. Would you guys agree? It was easy for him to fall. It was hard for him to be obedient. There was a difficulty to it in the humanity of it all. And we see that difficulty building up into a giant precipice here where in this moment as it's built up, we see in scripture that he tells these people to go away and he is troubled. He is sorrowful because now in his omniscience, right? In his omnipotence and all his attributes, guys, he has put these things aside and given them to the father. Not that he's letting go of them, but he's put them in submission to the father. And here he has fully accepted his humanity. And we see it. We see it in the text. So he can identify with you and I. It says in verse 38, then he said to them, my soul. Now, many of you aren't familiar with that word, my soul. Oh, you can speak of the flesh. You know, that song, don't break my heart, my achy, breaky heart. I just don't think you'd understand. We talk about the things that we feel. We have this way of personifying all the things that we go through. And man, it's very real to us. And it's very relatable to others because we all go through life. Sometimes we have issues in the areas of our marriage and we have to go through that. Sometimes we have issues with our kids and we got to go through it. Sometimes we even have issues with our bosses. I know, life, right? And we have to go through it. But what about your soul? How do you prioritize your soul? Do you guys realize your soul is the most real you? 
If I were to strip away the flesh and I were to strip away the emotions, maybe as a man, you've made it about your flesh and maybe as a a woman, you've made it about your emotions. But if I were to take both of those away, men and women today, and just take them off the table, even those things gone, it does not define you. What defines you is your soul. And here, this is the trick of the devil. He gets you focused on the flesh. He gets you focused on the emotions and you miss the trueness of it all, which is your soul and how it relates to your maker. Your soul and how you relate to God. And some of you have never suffered enough to ever suffer at the level of your soul. So you've never gotten to refinement there because you're still stuck up in the flesh and in the emotions of it all. Here's a maturity aspect to this all. And here Jesus, if anyone's gone through maturation, it's been Jesus. He had to learn how to walk being fully God and fully man. He had to learn how to crawl. He had to learn just like every other child, how to take his first words and form a sentence and put it together. Guys, Jesus understands the struggle. He understands your life. He can sympathize and he can empathize and he can have compassion with what you're going through. But here at the soul, he's overwhelmed. Let us be careful when we use that language because Overwhelmed is different than the physical. It's different than the spiritual. It's not about hitting a roadblock and saying, you know what? I know I can stay up this long and not fall asleep. And I know I can work this hard and not get tired. And I know I can go through this many stressful occurrences without my emotions getting the best of me. That's not what we're talking about today. I'm talking about an even deeper level where the emotions have been stripped away. The physical has been stripped away and the weight is on your soul. And here Jesus is at this final stage in testing and he's feeling it in his soul. And at his soul, he's overwhelmed with sorrow. And what does it say? To the point of death, other translations say during this period of time, what does he sweat? Blood. Scientists, they've studied this over and over again and they know that someone can only do that if they're under immense amounts of stress and pressure. You think you're overwhelmed, ladies and gentlemen? When was the last time you sweated blood? Some of you can't remember. Guys, he had found that threshold. He had found that wall. He was hitting his humanity against the head. He felt every weight of it. But what happens here when he's stressful? He says that I can feel in my soul, I am dying. I feel the weight of my situation. I I feel this humanity here And it's just on my shoulders, just like the high priest. It's on my heart and my chest, and it's making me feel like I can't breathe. Here he says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. And now imagine we're thinking that this is God in the flesh, right? He's going to have something where he just, just snapped the fingers, move forward, just fast forward through the day and get through this moment because you know what? It's going to get better from here. We all know it's going to get a lot worse from there. You get whipped, excruciating trial, illegal in every way. You think Trump's going through problems? Man, Jesus went through worse. And he's going through all these issues and gets all the way to this point where normally people die, even during this scourging and all the whipping. But no, he gets past the cat of nine tails. He gets to the cross. And even then he ends up paying the ultimate price. And if that's not enough, He fights death itself in the grave and he conquers that as well. But before all of this, he is humanly going through his problem, feeling the weight of it all. And he says, my father, if it's possible, you ever had that prayer? God, if it's possible, take me from this. May the cup be taken from me. This is the suffering, by the way, the cup. This is the sacrifice. These are the things that God He's saying, this is a must in your life. You you think you can get to the other door of glory. You think you're going to get to the other door of this trial and this struggle. And then you can just say, you know what? I want a different cup. God, I didn't sign up for this. God, this isn't what I feel like right now. God, I never thought in a million days I'd be going through this. Yet here we are. And we go to God and we say, God, give me another cup. And what does God tell him? Yet not as I will, but as you will. Okay, well, that's enough. God gave you an answer. Have you ever prayed? And then he gave you an answer and the answer was no. Oh man, we hate hearing that. Hate hearing it from our wives, our husbands, our kids. No, it just doesn't feel good when you receive it. Might feel good saying it, 
but receiving it, that's another thing. And he says here, then he returned to his disciples. And what does he find them? Sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch for me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And then he makes a parallel showing you guys the humanity of it all. He says here that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Guys, we have to be real with ourselves. There's a point in our own affliction where we say, well, God didn't sign me up to go through suffering. God, he didn't place me in this position to go through this in my marriage, to go through this with my kids. No, that's not God's plan. And so again, we go back to that pattern where we rationalize, we justify, we spiritualize, we do what we want to do. And yet we know God's rest is on the other side of that cup, but we don't want to take the cup. We don't want to take in the suffering of the moment to grow. Guys, there is a process to this thing called faith. And it doesn't please God to see you suffering. It pleases God to see you relying and trusting in God and trusting that if God brought you here, he's going to get you through it. He's got a plan for his people. And he's the one that cares about his people more than anybody because he's your representation before the father. He's your high priest. And knowing this, you would think that, man, Jesus got to know from God the Father, it's settled. He's good. Well, then he returned to his disciples, remember? They fell asleep. Hey, wake up. We've only been gone for like an hour. What are you guys doing? Flesh is weak. Jesus, our spirit, we want to do it, but can't keep our eyes open. Verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible... Or if it's possible or not possible, like, God, I, I just want a way out of this, right? God, if there's another way, tell me. And many of us, we've been there on the ledge and we're saying, God, I don't like the life that I have been dealt. I don't like the cards that I've been dealt. I don't like what I'm going through right now. You can't have this as a destiny for my life, let alone a purpose for my life. And then here, the greater lesson is, what is your life but a way to give glory to the Father? Guys, I cannot control what sin has done to this world. I cannot control what sin has done to you. But what I am in control of, guys, is my obedience to the Father through the Son. And as I adhere to the son's advice, as I adhere to what the son has prescribed for my life, and when I adhere to his blood offering on the cross, and I say, I can't, but I know my Jesus can. Jesus breaks through the mess. And oh, the mess we have because of sin, right? We need a high priest that's going to go before us and carry the weight on our shoulders and on our chest. And here he says to the father, God, you must have another way. But again, Jesus answers back. Nope. You got to take this cup and not only take it, you need to drink it. This is your cup to drink. Some of you have some suffering that God has called you to. And what you're trying to do right now is wiggle your way around it instead of learn the lesson through it. See guys, the lesson here, if you learn it, is being faithful to your father, even if it's difficult, because your dad knows best. Guys, some of you have good fathers and you can get it, but man, you have a heavenly father that his plan outweighs your problem. His plan outweighs your pain. His plan even outweighs your own purposes Guys, you think it's by accident that God says man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his step. He is the good shepherd that guides you to still waters. And if you follow even Psalm 23, it says he restores your soul. And Jesus in this moment, he's saying, God, restore my soul. My soul is heavy and I don't want this cup. 
And he says, not my will, but your will be done. And in verse 43, when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Some of you are missing out because you can't get beyond the physical. You can't get beyond the emotional. You are in a disarray tizzy, always going down, never going up because you think that going up means no problems and no trials and no suffering. But remember, when we have a high priest, it's not that we're not gonna go through sin. It's not that we're not gonna go through trials. It's not even that we're not gonna suffer. Because we have a high priest, we see here in scripture, no one takes this honor on himself. It says, because of this, he must make an offering for his own sins. Their past high priest guys, they were at fault. They had issues. They needed to go through each stage just to make sure that they would not die. And if they didn't die, make sure that they were able to give a sacrifice that was pleasing to God on behalf of the people. And then wait till next year and do it all over again. But guys, the high priest, he never sat down. They always would work and they would do so because the atonement was never enough. It wasn't permanent. It was temporary. And it was temporary because in every way, all these foreshadowings of the Levitical way, all of the testimonies, all of the festivals, all of the Jewish things were always meant to glorify God, not just in their present tense, but in the full proclamation of the Savior, Jesus Christ, so that they would be ready. And what's so beautiful, when Jesus takes this cup, immediately upon drinking it and moving forward in the suffering, drinking it means metaphorically taking on the suffering. He is the suffering servant prophesied long ago in the Old Testament. And if you're paying attention to the Old Testament, Jesus is the fulfillment of these things. And to the people that were diverting and leaving the church for the past things, he says, don't jump ship now. We're about to get to the best part. I got people jumping ship in their own faith, in their own sins, because they see their weight of their troubles. And they don't see Christ in the storm. But God is calling some of you out of your boats today. He's calling you out of the storm today. And he's not calling you to a place of safety. He might be calling you to a place of obscurity. He might be calling you to a place of suffering. He might be calling you to desert places, but man, God is so good at placing oases and opening up rocks and having water flow out right when it's needed. God is teaching us in this season to be dependent not on our own minds and our own wills and our own nature, but on Jesus Christ, the mediator that goes into the temple, that is perfect in every way, that carries the weight of our sin, that goes through all of these steps to get before the Father. And when he brings his own blood, it's not like the blood that was before. His blood hits that mercy seat and he doesn't need a temple because they probably prophesied long ago that it wasn't about a temple that was built by human hands. The temple, ladies and gentlemen, was always a thing that was supposed to point to your hearts. And the mercy seat that he pours his blood on is your hearts. The Savior, he takes his atoning blood, his perfect blood, and he takes it and he pours it. He pours it on the hearts of his people and he makes them right so that they not only gain salvation, they gain a perfect high priest who cares for them. So now you can read in the New Testament, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you, because he is your high priest. He is taking on your burden on his shoulders. He is bore your sins on his heart. And when they pierced him, that water and that blood, it mingled out and it showed that he conquered sin once and for all on the cross so that all those who believe in Jesus Christ and they believe that he conquered death, they believe that he conquered the grave and they place their faith. That means that they get here and they sit just like Jesus sat right next to the Father. Because when Jesus sat next to the Father, he did so because as a high priest, the atoning work was done. Once and for all, it is finished to telestai. Account 
paid in full. And when we look to other places for our fulfillment, we spit out what Jesus did on the cross as the perfect Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Guys, there is no other way to deal with your sin. Jesus is the mediator now between God and the world. And so we need to look to Jesus. That's why it says in all these times where they would have moments where they didn't understand the obscurity of the Old Testament. And they would see that they would lift up a snake. And why are they looking to him? And then later on, John chapter 3, Nicodemus realizes from the mouth of Jesus, I'm that person that must be lifted up. Again, all these things are foreshadowing of what Jesus would become to his people. And here's the big part that I don't want you to miss. Those veils that you saw, you saw those curtains, one, two, three, separating those three aspects. Guys, the veil was torn the moment Jesus died on the cross and his blood, it was shed. You guys understand that the veil tearing was a miracle in and of itself. Josephus, one of the greatest historians of that time period, who was a Jew, not even a professing Christian, he wrote that it would take two horses, the strongest horses, pulling apart, and even for those two horses pulling in different directions, would struggle to do so. And the way that it was anchored in wasn't so that if the temple fell down, it would rip. If it fell down, there was no way of ripping. And so the miracle here, when the veil tears from the top down, it was for the Gentiles and the Jews to understand the fulfillment in Ephesians 3, when he tears down that wall of hostility between the holies of holies, where now there was a divide between God and man because of the atonement of sin. That veil has been torn. The holies of holies has been opened up to the world through Jesus Christ. And when we live in his anointing and we live in his promises and we live in his truth he fills us with his power and his presence and then we can shout to the world when they tell us no we can say yes before I couldn't do it but thanks be to God I can because now I understand I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength church wake up Wake up and realize the high priest that you have, the savior that you have, that has made a way for you. He doesn't stop being one. You don't need to go to a Catholic church to get to a place where you give him your sins. There's one mediator between God and man, it's Christ Jesus. Don't go to the world, don't go to a pastor. You need only one high priest and his name is Jesus. My job as a pastor is not to replace a high priest. Lord knows I am deficient in that regard but we need only Jesus. And in this love of Jesus, then the pastors, the priests, the prophets, the apostles, all these people find their meaning in Christ. Guys, the church, you, the body of believers have significant purpose when you see that some of you are the thumb, but you gotta be attached to a hand. Some of you are a hand and you gotta get attached to an elbow. Some of you are an elbow, you gotta get attached to the body. And when you realize that body, there's a high priest that's covering you, that is caring for you, that his blood is there for you, then you can see that here in scripture, we see bringing it all together. He says, you are my son. When he did this, he says, today I become your father. This was him saying back all the way as we prophesied before and talked about in 1 verse 5. We see here now in Psalm 2, 7, it's the same thing again. Why does he do that? He's showing and reminding you he is the eternal king. But we see an, a, a juxtaposition, a comparison that had never been done before by the author of Hebrews. Because up at this point, it was only connected to the line of Aaron. But now this obscure passage that we're going to go into detail that will literally be the heartbeat to the entire book of Hebrews going forward is this line of Melchizedek. And in Genesis, there's some obscure verses that's very small. You see this guy coming out after this battle with all these kings and this man that is both a priest and a king, he comes and he breaks bread and wine and Abraham gives him a tithe offering and a gift. And he functions as this way. We don't see that he has a beginning or end with a, a mom and dad. We don't see they're both human, 
We know the Aaronic side is human. We know the Melchizedek side is human. But we see that this preceded the other. Melchizedek was before the Levitical order was established. And this order is perfectly eternal through Jesus Christ. And so now Jesus Christ is not coming off of the Aaronic line. He is coming off the line of Melchizedek where there is no beginning and end of succession, but a continuation that is eternal in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus alone. So that we don't look to another priest. We go to Jesus and we go to Jesus alone to mediate on behalf of us. And he says in verse 7, during his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries. Guys, he is referring to Gethsemane here. This is his active cry as a priest to you, his compassion. And compassion is not sympathy. You can sympathize with someone but never walk with them in their life. But here we see compassion. Why well, I love that word. It's love in action. You say you love Jesus. You say Jesus saved you, and I say saved you from what? So you could live the same life the same way? So that they could see you and not glorify God? The whole point of God saving you is that you would become a walking, talking billboard for Jesus. So that when people see you, they see Jesus. And that means for that to happen, you got to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I am insufficient in this. I need some Bible studies. I need some mentors. I need some discipleship. I need help. There are pastors and teachers and preachers all around this city that want to help. But the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Everybody wants to pray for a harvest. Nobody wants to show up for work. We are so good at pontificating on Sabbath and rest that we don't even know what it's about. It's about trusting in God. And if you say you're good at Sabbathing and you're good at resting, then you should be equally good at leading people to Jesus where they get their eternal rest, the rest their soul needs, the rest their physicalness needs, the rest their emotion needs. We lead them to the high priest to get all three so they're not walking around broken, but they're walking around as walking, talking masterpieces for the Savior and use that the purpose and the disposal of however the Savior sees fit. If God wants to use me till I burn out, at least I'm burning out for Jesus, not to the nine to five and all the other things that go on in our world. Turn your engineer job into an opportunity to preach the gospel. You as teachers, turn this into an opportunity to preach the gospel. You as moms and dads, use it as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Do not create wiggle room for excuses but let the Holy Spirit fill you in such a way that you fill this room with His Spirit because His Spirit has been filled in you because you have lived in His Word and His Word is coming out of every orifice of your body. You cannot help but preach the gospel in season and out of season because He is the seasoning. He is the salt that goes in. He is the water that comes out. He's the river, water. He's everything, guys. And we see he's not only that, he's our eternal priest. So he's our eternal king. He's our eternal priest house. So he says here, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That has no beginning and end. It was succeeding up to that point, open-ended. But here Jesus, he gives an exclamation point. This is my role. And all the other people were former, but I am what they were all pointing it says in verse 7, during his earthly life, he offered the prayers he shows in Gethsemane, all these things. Through his death, he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And after he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Look to no one else if you obey Christ, not just the law. You will not just get circumcised hourly because that's not what it's about anymore. It's about getting circumcised at the level of your heart. Ezekiel prophesied long ago in the same way, guys. You know, Melchizedek, he fulfilled two offices. He was king and he was priest. Ezekiel, guys, he was prophet and he was priest. But only in Jesus 
Is he prophet? Is he priest? Is he king? In every way, in every office, he holds and sustains everything. So when he comes back at the millennial reign, you the ones with talents, you the ones with faith, you the ones that believe. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, the people with his blood came back to life. The resurrection, the graves of the saints, not those who didn't believe, but those who believed in God came out of those graves to show you again as a reflection of what is to come. Hold on and buckle your seatbelt. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming back soon. Let us get excited about God's word again. Let us wake up to the reality that Jesus is still working. And if he is speaking to your dry bones and giving you life again, don't let it go by the wayside. Find the good soil. Let God dig a deep hole and make your stand and say, this is not my life, but take the cup that you've been avoiding, the suffering that you've been circumventing, the jobs and all the things that you put in front, the money that you put in front, all the status that you put in front and put God where he deserves in the forefront of it all. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto you. God wants to add some value to your life. God wants to add his spirit into your life, but you got to open up your heart to his ultimate reality that he doesn't just want you to follow to religion. He wants you to follow to a relationship. He wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and thanks be to God with all your strength so that even when your strength is weary and you are weak, you will find just like Paul did, you might pray for a thorn to go away, but Jesus Christ He is the one that shows you even in your weakness, He is strong. Even in your deficiencies, He is sufficient. And even in the areas where you are feeling like you got to quit, you better tie a knot and hold on because God is going to take you on the ride of a lifetime. If you do it with Him and you start to live a life of faith, you'll look back and you'll say, how did I ever do it any other way? The only way is to take that chair to say, I'm not just looking at God. I'm not just seeing God. I'm going to take Him on as my high priest. I'm going to invite Him into my life. And by doing so, He's going to put all the sins of the world on his shoulder, including mine. He's going to bear my failures on his heart, and he's going to do what no one else can do. He's going to make me right before God. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to be made right today? You want to get right today? Then let God in today. Let God come into the temple today. Let him sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat today that is your life and the Holy Spirit will tabernacle amongst you. He will give you not only dreams and visions, He'll give you what your heart's been longing for all along, a God-given purpose. And oh, when you get that sweet purpose, that might have a heavy cup of affliction, don't despise it, but do as Jesus did. Accept it, drink it, and know on the other end of suffering, guys, is glory. Glory in Jesus' name and in Jesus' name alone. I'm calling people back to repent. I'm calling people that have fallen away to have faith. And I'm calling people that have broken today for the things of God that were far from Him to come to Jesus and not do it superficially, but do it inwardly. Do it realistically. Do it the real way you can. Jesus, I am a sinner and I am in need of you, my Savior. Jesus, I don't just want you to be the leader of my life. I want you to be the high priest in my heart. I want you to take your blood every day before my sins. And I want you to teach me what godliness is. I want you to teach me what holiness is. I want you to teach me how to make things right again. Lord, come into my heart. Change me from the inside out. If you pray that prayer and you let him in, Jesus will come in this moment. Do you believe? Oh, church, do you believe? Church, do you believe? Church, do you believe? Let's stand up, let's worship God if you believe. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell the world that not only Jesus is alive, but Jesus' purpose is still at work. Be blessed. What an amazing service we had here today at Lift the Church. If that was you today, and the Holy Spirit brought conviction to your heart, 
I wanna go ahead and ask that you would get connected to our team. You would get connected to this family so that we could walk this life with you while you're there connecting with us today. We ask that if the Spirit has moved your heart to give, down below we're gonna have a QR code that you can help us out with. Your giving supports our ministries in, in so many different ways. And so we ask that you go ahead and you scan that QR code. And we want to thank you so much because any amount helps. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Lifted YouTube Live. We hope that you enjoyed the service. And don't worry, we will be back next week for another amazing message. Until then, we will see you soon.